So I'm going to tell you a story about this, what happened. Uh, it's a little over a year ago with Earl. Uh, he was a good friend. Um, not my typical friend. Um, very gruff, uh, non, he just didn't fear God. He just, uh, just uh, was a little bit angry at God for a few reasons we'll talk about a little bit later. And he was brought up kind of alone. His family, they moved around a lot. His family wasn't very tight. Brothers and sisters, not tight at all. But um, very crafty man. Could build anything. Um, and as always, we used, to, we used to joke, always Earl's way. But he was a, he was a, he was a very unique man. Uh, won two World Cups, uh, snipe sailing in Africa when he was younger. Very pronounced sailor. I mean, the guy would... Uh, would just beat the socks off anybody out there in the water. Um, and all learned on his own, all from his own talents. Uh, not taught in school, things like that, just he learned it on his own, learned how to talk to the wind. And that's the way he worked his life. So he came down a few, a few years ago with prostate cancer. Yeah. Uh, he used to love going fishing with me. We built a boat together. Um, and we love fishing rockfish. It was just the light of his life to see that happen. We just bring in the rockfish up. He just loved it. So we would go all the time together. But came down with prostate cancer. And it was severe. Um, I think it was stage four right off the bat in his bones. And it was a tough hit for him because he was not the type of person to get taken down by anybody or anything. He was about 70, I think he was 73 years old at the time. He was up in Oregon when he heard the news. Uh, they had a little farmhouse there. Came back down to San Diego. Started going through some of the testing, chemotherapies and all that. Uh, nothing was working. It got worse and worse. His pain increased. And then kind of where this story starts, uh, he knew that uh, I was a Christian, God-fearing. Um, we weren't really allowed to talk about it with each other because it wasn't something he was into at all. Mm -hmm. Um, he called me about 5 o'clock in the morning from uh, Sharps Hospital in severe pain um, and he said he was done and I came so I went to the hospital at about 5 in the morning his wife was there and um, we discussed a little bit about what, what he wanted to do and he said he was done didn't want to and <clears throat> did not want to keep going through this the treatments the pain he says, I'm, I'm done. And so <clears throat> I brought him home from the hospital. Was he, he was doing chemotherapy? Doing chemotherapy. Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, but his, the reason why he was in the hospital is not from that. It was from just the pain level he was experiencing. Gotcha. And I brought him home. <clears throat> we walk in the house, and, and this, we were, of course, not saying a whole lot because we knew this was the bad. This was bad. And he was calling for hospice. And there's this dog was sick. Um, and he knew the dog was dying too. But the dog was in really bad shape when we got home. So I told him I would bring it to a good friend of ours who was a vet to put him down. A two hour drive. I could have done it somewhere closer. But I knew he wanted the dog to go to our friend. So I drove the dog up to Hammett. And Earl did not believe me. But I bought the dog a couple hamburgers. <laughs> For his last meal, oh, yeah. and yeah, and uh, I asked the dog if he wanted a cigarette. Yeah, and <laughs> dog didn't want the cigarette, but ate the hamburgers in the car. <laughs> and both Earl and Susan, his wife, said, uh, "No way, the dog doesn't eat in the car. Doesn't yeah. eat in the car." Well, they ate two hamburgers in the car, Jack and Box hamburgers. Oh wow! And then I brought it, and then we we put the dog down, and I came back to San Diego, went to his house. Susan was up by the pond, the fish pond in the backyard. Not doing well. His wife. His wife. Yeah. And um, Earl and I proceeded to talk. He had just lost his uh, son, just well, it was been five, six years ago, but very fresh. Melanoma, 35 years old. Very, uh, hit him very hard. And he said he didn't want his wife to go through that same process uh, with him. Right. And he asked me to be with him throughout the hospice time. And I said I'd do it. And I asked him what did he what, what how he wanted to do this. Did he want to have a party? You know, have friends over it and everybody kinda of knows what's happening here? 
or you want to close the blinds and uh, and just die on your own, you yeah. know, just with us here. And he says, let's have a party. So we made a few phone calls, and uh, within hours, there were just floods of his friends, past friends that he had actually punched out. <laughs> you know, people, yeah. people that he had arguments with, people that he built things with, old, young, he did impact a lot of lives. Yeah. I would guess there was probably close to 200 people came by the house in, in a, oh, wow. in a f five, six day period to say goodbye. Yeah. And Earl said goodbye to a lot of them and he would, he would hold a beer. He loved to drink beer, as uh, most of his friends knew. He would hold a beer in his hand and take a sip out of it while on hospice and just because, he, you know, that was his, that's what he wanted to do and he, yeah. and he did it. And every sip during hospice he'd say, Man, this is the best tasting beer I've ever had in my life. <laughs> it was pretty, pretty funny. And as time went on, he, <clears throat> he was getting tired. Uh, then he stopped, and he wanted less people, just wanted friends, close, close friends. And then, that, and then it got to the point where just me and his wife were pretty much there the whole time. Um, I still wanted an urge to talk to him about, about God, about... Uh, mm about what peace he can offer him at that mm -hmm. time. But, uh, boy, it just wasn't, you could tell any time I even kind of got close to the subject, it was, he didn't, didn't want to hear it. Yeah. One day we, um, it was towards the evening, he asked everybody to leave. There was a few people there. Um, he was very anxious. Uh, his, he was in a lot of pain, even though we were on a morphine drip right in his womb, or right in his uh, prostate bone area. And a, um, I think it's lorazepam. We were grinding lorazepam up to give him just in his in his cheek for pain and for uh, anxiety. But he was not settled that night. So we left. A couple of close friends of us went out to dinner. Susan stayed home with him. And I came back, you know, about eight o'clock that night. And he was still a little bit restless. wasn't saying anything, but just restless. So we, the lights were kind of dim. I got on his left side and um, grabbed his hand, you know, uh, just to let him know I was there. I don't know if he if he had vision at the time. His eyes were very blank, stare, you know, it was, and the pupils were very dilated. And I didn't, I, I don't know if he could see. Um, he wasn't talking. <clears throat> so grabbed his hand and I started praying internally. Uh, not verbally at all, just in inside. And I just asked God that uh, He would allow Earl to hear this prayer. Allow him to jump in his lap, in God's lap, and just as a child, yeah. take away all the all the, the clutter of life that brought him to his anger against him. All those things that, because God didn't do anything to him. And I yeah. just said, allow him to, to be able to just release all that and have a discussion with you personally to understand who you are. And I, I went on for quite a while, talked about his son, you know, how angered he was about his son. He wanted to see his son again. I said, this, this is how it's going to happen. Um, it's all in, but not out loud. And Susan knew I was praying, I think, and she came down right around that time when I, when I was praying and grabbed his right hand and sat there. Yeah. Didn't hear anything I was saying, but she was still and quiet. And I went on, I, I would say, a good five minutes, just talk, just talking to God and, and just asking, praying and pleading that he could, uh, that Earl could hear the prayer. Mm -hmm. And then... Internally, I like to sing a little bit. I'm terrible at it, but I like to sing a little bit. And I, um, I got into some, some songs then, internally, not out loud at all, just uh, songs like Amazing Grace, how sweet it sounds. Because if I sang those out loud to Earl, yeah. it would have been a you know, good left hand to the, to the jawbone. Yeah. Uh, but now on his deathbed, I still didn't know how he would react. So I didn't, I didn't know how his wife would react. And I don't like really singing out loud, uh, you know, in front of a bunch of people anyway. So, yeah. so I went ahead and um, started singing internally, Amazing Grace, Oh Lord My God, many, many songs that just I knew from, um, uh, from 
my you know, church background, Christian music. And um, I think I went on for, in my head, just as many songs as I possibly could for probably about 10 minutes. And at the very end, I sang a song in my head that I used to sing to my kids when they were just terribly restless, when they were young. I didn't even know the name of the song. I didn't know all the words to it. But it was a song that, that was special in my heart because uh, I, I, whenever the kids were in the car or we were going on a trip and they got restless, I would sing that song and it calm right down. They loved it. They just loved it. And it was a song called uh, Rise Again. I found out later by Dallas Home. And it's, uh, you know, go ahead, drive the nails in my hands. Laugh at me where you stand. Go ahead, say it isn't me. The day will come. When you will see, cause I'll rise again. Ain't no power on earth can tie me down. So they, I sang that song as many of the words as I knew. Internally again, Susan didn't hear anything. Nothing being said. Um, and I stopped singing and sat there in silence for a little bit. And Earl said, I want to hear the music. He just said it, clear, stay. He says, I want to hear the music. And Susan was baffled. I was scared. I said, oh, <laughs> so, something happened here that uh, I wasn't expecting. And uh, I wanted it to, of course, but I wasn't expecting it. And Susan said, you want to hear the music? And I said, Susan, do you know any kind of music that Earl likes? Uh, she said, I don't know. I don't, because she's not really doesn't listen to music much, but she said, I, I think I got a Jimmy Buffett tape. And Earl just kind of turns and looks at me and goes, no, in a pleading voice. He goes, I want to hear the music you're putting in my head. And now I'm really baffled and, uh, and scared. First off, I didn't want to sing out loud. <laughs> Second off, uh, it was amazing what, what happened. So then I went ahead and started singing the songs out loud, Amazing Grace, and he was just saying, thank you. He just kept repeating, thank you, thank you, I love it, I love it. Songs that I sang internally, I was singing out loud to him, which was amazing. And I know that can happen to people on, on their deathbed. And I have to also interject, uh, uh, during this period, just before I started all this, uh, I had given him two, two lorazepam in his mouth before I left for dinner, and then I gave him two more when I got back because he was still so restless. And then we hit the morphine a few more times because you know, you could tell he was in pain. So you would think the person would have been out completely with that, you know. And I sang Amazing Grace and O Lord My God and, uh, and uh, Give Air to My Words, O Lord. I mean, I went on for, you know, a good ten 10 minutes of singing out loud. And um, I, got, I, I finished, and then he said, uh, Nails. Yeah. I didn't, I, I kind of knew what he was saying, but I did not sing that song I sang to my kids out loud because it was, uh, it's just, it was just, it's a hard song to sing, very hard for me. And I, I, just, I, didn't, I chose not to sing it out loud. And, and he said twice, nails. And Susan looks at him and says, what do you mean, Earl, nails? You want nails from the garage? Or what, what are you talking about? So she clearly heard that too. And I, and I clearly heard it. And, and, then you, I, and you thought you knew, you thought you, you knew what he was saying? Yeah, because that song that I didn't sing was the only song I didn't sing back out loud. Um, and I said, Earl, you mean the song that I used to sing to my kids? when they were restless. Oh, right. And he said yes. Clearly said yes. So I sang the song, go ahead. Drive the nails in my hands and feet, or laugh at me where you stand. And um, he was crying. You know, he was crying, and I was crying. Susan was crying. Um, very, very, just thanking me and, and just, very moving, powerful moment. And then I wished I knew all the words to the song. Yeah. <laughs> but I sang as many as I did. And then he said to Susan, I see Jimmy. After the song was done, he says, I see Jimmy. 
And Susan started really crying, and she says, I see Jim. You see Jimmy? He says, I see Jimmy. And she says, oh, please tell him I love him. Their son. Her son. That died five years before with melanoma. 36. And, uh, and he looks at me, and he says, uh, can you come with me? And I, I was really... Really shocked. I've had a lot of unique experiences in my life. Done a lot of things that uh, where I don't know why I'm still here anyway. You know, I mean, I said, Earl, Earl, man, I tell you, this right here is one reason why I know, I know, that I'm not gone. Be able to do this, and I said, thank you for allowing me to be experiencing this with you. Yeah. And. Um, he 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 was at really at peace, and then. Out of nowhere, it was a very amazing. He said, Martha, as if he was seeing somebody. And Susan and I looked at each other, and Susan said, Martha Earl. And I, I said, Susan, do you know? Do you know um, a Martha and his family? Any kind of family members? Anybody close by the name of Martha? And she said, No. And Earl said it again, Martha. And she said, and then Susan said, the only Martha I know is Martha Stewart. Yeah. And Earl just, let, just lets out this plate and says, no. <laughs> and then he goes off into a, you know, fast, deep sleep. We didn't, you didn't say anything else after that at all. And Earl and Susan and I just looked at each other in just amazement. But she didn't, she wasn't privy to the information that was, that happened before, the prayer and all that. She was just baffled by what went on. Right. But she remembers all of it very clear. She remembers how it went because she told me that if she didn't back my story when I was telling it to people, yeah. that I could be deemed crazy. <laughs> yeah. Which I probably would have been deemed crazy and still am with some people. But we did talk about that night and I came home just uh, very, uh, just, just uh, wore out. Yeah. And I had to look up that song online uh, to find out what the name of it was, and um, and what it, and, and exactly you know who wrote it and, and and the words how it was sung. So I YouTube it and I found out it was called "Rise Again" by Dallas Home. And I started watching it with lyrics, uh, so I do so I could see the words. And the opening scene at the start of the song is a full screen of nails. I mean, just a full screen of nails. And Earl had never considered probably even looking at a religious thing on TV or seeing this. This song was written, I don't know, I think 30 years ago. Um, and I was shocked when I saw the nails and I realized that's why he said nails. And then the lyrics come on. And just before the last uh, verse of the, of the, of the song, they choose to put up a verse on the on the screen, and it says, "Martha said, Jesus would rise again on Resurrection Day, John 11:24." It's not in the lyrics of the song. It's just on the screen. Earl had never seen that before. I had never seen it before. How that came out had to be inspired. It had to be a vision that he had that that was for me. And for this story that I'm telling you right now. Yeah. I was so excited that night, I could hardly sleep. Next morning, I got up early, went back to his house with his wife. And Earl was pretty quiet. And I had to show her the YouTube video just to show her and let Earl hear, if he was hearing, how that song went. And I pulled it up on the screen and uh, showed Susan the nails and the Martha said, Jesus would rise again on Resurrection Day. She walked off crying and realized something happened again. You know, we just knew something happened divine. And um, she was just uh, she was just uh, just crying. She was sobbing the rest of the day, and um, I was was shocked. I couldn't stop telling the story. Yeah, told everybody that uh, wanted to hear it. The reactions have been very, very different between people. Some people don't uh, don't know how to react to it. But for me, you know, 
I've had people say, well, maybe you were saying and singing out loud. You know, maybe you, maybe you want, you were singing loud enough for him to hear. Um, didn't happen. Susan didn't hear me singing. Why did he want to hear the music? He, he, God talked to him. He jumped in God's lap. He, ju he jumped in Jesus' lap. And he had a conversation with him. And, and then to, to bring out the rest of it was then he saw Jimmy, because that was part of my prayer. He, he, I didn't say it out loud. That was another thing inside. And then, and then the Martha, she was baffling at the time, but then I realized what it was. And, uh, and it's importance. So, some Christians, I think, have a hard time with it because they, they believe that, you know, you, we all believe that you can accept God at late stages in life, but uh, for a gruff old man, that was a pretty amazing thing to happen. And I know for a fact that he is with his Savior now. And I know that there is a Savior. I always did. But uh, clearly, this is, was a very amazing experience.